are you holding up under the <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to be able to welcome so many of you into my home. Not only those of you who actually are here, but also those of you who are here indirectly through the medium of motion picture film. Now, as you know, the title of this presentation is The Grand Design. But I should explain at the outset that the real subject behind this title is U.S. foreign policy. Now, I realize that there are some who might think that I was trying to be funny or sarcastic with that statement, because for a long time, there's been a generally accepted view that our foreign policy has been so bungled and confused that it couldn't possibly have followed any design, much less a grand one. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of this presentation is to show not only that there is a grand design, but that it has been the consistent dominant force behind absolutely every major move by the United States in the foreign policy field since at least the end of World War II. This grand design has provided the motivation for all we have done in the past. And unless some basic changes are made, it will determine everything we shall do in the future. Now, regardless of one's opinion of this grand design, it's the outgrowth of a powerful and compelling argument, a profound statement of philosophy, and a deceptively attractive appeal to reason. And ladies and gentlemen, unless we are able to counter this argument and to offer a superior philosophy, we'll continue to be like putty in the hands of its advocates. So it's important, to say the least, for us to understand what the grand design is, to analyze it in order to discover its flaws, if any, and then, to offer a superior alternative if we can. These three requirements then will constitute the general outline of the material and the ideas to be presented here. First, identification. Second, analysis. And third, solution. Now, to plunge right into the core of this challenge, what I'm going to do now is advocate the grand design just as though I really believed in it which in all honesty, at one time I did. In fact, I'm going to teach it to you, just the way it was taught to me at the University of Michigan. Now, following the form of what we might call uh, an extended syllogism, here is how the argument begins. One, we are living in a new age. And of course, you can't hardly argue with that. We're always living in a new age. But nevertheless, we're reminded of that profound fact rather elaborately. We're living in an age of marvelous and incredible technological advances, an age in which men travel faster than the speed of sound, in which satellites forge communication links between continents, in which space itself has become a limitless frontier of exploration. And then at the end of the list of all these wondrous and productive scientific achievements, always we are reminded with ominous overtones, that we also have something with us now called the bomb. End of step one, ready now for step two. By the way, everything up to this point not only is true, it's so obviously true that it's really not part of the argument at all. It's merely thrown in at the beginning as a kind of conditioner to get us nodding our heads in agreement in hopes that the habit will carry over into the next step which is where the going gets tricky and where we need to be far more on our guard. The next step then, the real premise of the grand design is this. If all out war should develop today between major powers, both sides would lose. No one could come out ahead in that kind of a war. Everyone would lose. It wouldn't make any difference who the good guys were or who the bad guys were. It wouldn't make any difference who started it, or even if it were started by accident. Both sides would lose. All right, now having acknowledged existence of the bomb, 
And having concluded that risking war is unthinkable in this modern age, we move now to step number three, which is this. Since the communists have nuclear weapons, and since they certainly would use them in their own self-defense, that means, doesn't it, that victory over communism is impossible. Now, we may wish that it were possible, we may wish that we were living in a bygone era in which if one had an enemy, he could meet him on the open battlefield and get it over with. We may wish that a lot of things were different in this old world. But instead of moaning and weeping and longing after those things which are no longer possible, let's grow up, be mature, intelligent human beings and face life the way it really is. Rather than living in a fantasy world, dreaming and longing after those things we want but can never have, Instead, let's find out what is the best we can get and then work for that. All right, now the next step. It's not enough for us just to know that victory is impossible. For our own safety, we must conduct our foreign affairs in such a way as to reflect this knowledge to the other side. We must be extremely careful never to give the enemy any cause to question our benign intent. We must avoid using any words or committing any acts which might even suggest that we were pursuing a goal of victory. We can't afford to gamble on what the enemy might do in response. In other words, we mustn't frighten the communists or give them any cause for self-defensive panic. In fact, to take it one step further, we must avoid the temptation even to embarrass the Soviets in the eyes of the world. You see, the argument is that it's like being locked in a cage with a dangerous animal. You can't get out of the cage and you can't kill the animal. So what do you do when it becomes hungry and restless? You feed it, hoping that if it's full and comfortable and contented, then it won't eat you. <laughs> well, the people who have created U.S. foreign policy over the past two decades view the United States as being locked in a worldwide cage with a dangerous animal called communism. We can't get out of the cage, obviously. And since victory is impossible, remember, we can't destroy the animal. So to minimize the chances of communism turning on us, these planners not only have avoided frightening the animal with any overt moves, which it might mistakenly view as a threat to itself. But they've done everything possible to keep the beast fed, comfortable, and content. It's in our own interest, they say, to see that communist regimes remain reasonably stable. If they need wheat or other agricultural commodities, send it to them. If they need industrial know-how, invite their scientists and engineers to tour our factories so they can learn how best to produce if they still can't manufacture the goods they need, then send our own people over there to build their plants and set up their production lines. If that doesn't work, then sell the products to them on easy credit terms and don't really expect to get paid. In fact, if they need money, give that to them too. Give them anything they need so they won't become restless and aggressive. And yes, as harsh as it may seem on the surface, it's even in our best interest to see that communist regimes can successfully put down internal anti-communist revolts. Now, none of this because we're pro-communist. Only because we're mature, objective, intelligent people who recognize that in this modern nuclear age, we can't afford the risk to our own survival, which would be inherent in having so powerful an adversary struggling defensively to maintain his position. All right, we're ready now for the final step in the grand design, which concerns itself with the question of realistic, attainable goals. What is the best we can hope to achieve in this new age with all of its complexities? How do we resolve this dilemma before we all go up in a mushroom cloud of nuclear dust? The answer that is offered to us is this. We should encourage the communist world gradually to move toward us, ideologically, politically, and economically, while at the same time, we must be willing to move toward them 
ideologically, politically, and economically, to the point where hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be able to merge our system with theirs, and of course with those of the rest of the world, to form some kind of a world brotherhood, a world union, a world government, to be exact, which by definition would hold a monopoly over all these weapons of mass destruction, and then nuclear war between nations finally would be impossible for the simple reason that there no longer would be any nations, including our own. There would remain only a group of disarmed political subdivisions of an all-powerful world government. Of course, the grand designers scoff at the suggestion that such a concentration of power in one place might ideally be suited for a total consolidation of control into the hands of a small group of power-hungry world politicians. They particularly scoff at the possibility of this power falling into communist hands through the tactics used so successfully by their agents working within every other coalition government in which they've ever participated. We're assured that since this would be a world coalition government, for that reason, the communists wouldn't try to seize power. They'd be content merely to share in it. Well, without going into that particular little fantasy, just for the sake of discussion, let's grant the point and assume that a world coalition government with the communists really would result in a merger of our systems rather than the domination of theirs over ours. What then? Well, first of all, we would have to be willing to give up certain things that we would rather retain, such as our sovereignty and our independence. In other words, we must be willing to abide by the political dictates of the majority of other nations. One man, one vote in a world democracy. We must merge our monetary system with those of other nations, eventually to form a world currency. We must willingly submit all international disputes to a world supreme court and abide by those decisions regardless of the outcome. And above all, we must turn over our most powerful weapons and even our armies to international control so that the new world government will possess sufficient military might to compel the various political subdivisions by force, if necessary, to comply with the dictates of its laws and the decrees of its court. Now, to be sure, we'd prefer not to have to do any of these things, because obviously, if we're going to merge with other countries, other cultures, other legal systems and political ideologies, we can't expect the whole world to adopt our way of doing things. It'll be a give-and-take situation in which we'll have to seek a common denominator, a middle ground between our way of life and the way things are done in other parts of the world. And, of course, the result of such a compromise of systems predictably would have to be a mixture of the volatile dictatorships of Latin America, the tribal customs of newly emerging Africa, and the socialist regimes of Europe and Asia. Add to this concoction the necessity to absorb the doctrines and methods of communist regimes, and it's rather obvious that we're just going to have to give up certain cherished traditions and customs and learn to adjust to a way of life substantially different from that which we inherited. But it won't be so bad. We'll get used to it, and future generations won't know the difference. Besides, we really don't have any choice in the matter. It's that or the bomb. So let's get on with the job of putting an end to our own nationhood, as it has been historically defined. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the men who have formulated this grand design consider themselves to be part of the intellectual elite. In other words, in their opinion, they're just a little smarter than the rest of us. They feel that the average American doesn't quite have the intelligence or the aptitude to understand the wisdom of their grand design. As a matter of fact, they're rather worried that if enough of the American people suddenly discovered what was really going on, they might get out of hand and insist on their leaders doing something silly, like winning for a change. <laughs> and so in order to keep us contented at the polls, and to prevent us from asking too many questions, 
Sometimes it's necessary for them to put up a pretty good show of standing firm against the communists, to make some strong nationalistic statements now and then, and perhaps even to get us involved in some limited wars, which, although they're clearly not in waged in any way to endanger the enemy or weaken his position, still, with the daily loss of American lives in a shooting war against communists, who would dare suggest that our foreign policy is soft on communism? And in this way, the grand designers are confident that the American people will remain satisfied that their leaders are really standing firm and doing all that is humanly possible. But in reality, ladies and gentlemen, they're merely buying time. It's their plan that the old timers among us, those of you who have been raised with those old fashioned and outmoded concepts of patriotism and love of country, that in time, your generation will pass away or at least become the minority voice. And at the same time, they're catching the younger generations coming up through the high schools and the colleges like they caught me. And the grand designers are confident that in just a few more years, especially if they can lower the voting age, the political majority of the American people can be conditioned to accept the total abandonment of our national sovereignty. Well, now I realize that for those of you who have never before heard the grand design spelled out in detail like this, it's almost impossible to believe that it's real. And there may be some of you who are wondering if perhaps I just haven't dreamed up all this. So let's turn now to the actual words and the documents of those men who not only fully endorse the grand design, but those who have been instrumental in creating it in the first place and who helped to put it into action. Now I'm going to try not to bore you with a lot of long quotations, but in order to give you some idea of just how real and consistent this grand design is, I think it's necessary to offer concrete examples from a broad spectrum of American leadership and over a wide time span. For the philosophy which I've just summarized has been held and preached for many years by opinion molders in the communications media, by congressmen and senators, by high-ranking personnel in all agencies of the federal government, by secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, Supreme Court justices, and even presidents of the United States. A good place to begin is with a speech delivered by Joseph E. Johnson on February 2nd, 1959. Mr. Johnson, as you may recall, formerly was the number one man in charge of our State Department Policy Planning Division. But at the time of these remarks, he was president of the Carnegie Endowment Fund for International Peace, one of the many tax-exempt foundations that all together spend each year millions of dollars just to promote the grand design. Now, speaking at a luncheon in New York, Joseph E. Johnson said, and this is a direct quote, from now on, every decision facing the United States in this foreign policy field must be taken in light of the fact that a good part of the country could be destroyed. We must be prepared to fight limited wars, limited as to weapons and as to goals, to stabilize the situation temporarily, tide things over, but victory is no longer possible. Well, moving from the State Department now to the Defense Department and to the Pentagon, we come across this article syndicated by the Associated Press on February 4th, 1968, entitled Robert S. McNamara, Reflections After Seven Years on the Hot Seat. And I think you'll find most revealing this direct quote from our former Secretary of Defense. It became clear that we couldn't win a strategic nuclear war. The concept of massive retaliation was ruled out. Then it was necessary to educate the public and the Congress that we couldn't win a strategic nuclear war. We said it in different ways over a period of time. I consider getting that concept across our greatest single accomplishment. Well, in the transcript of the hearings before the Senate Armed Services Committee on February 25th, 1966, again we find McNamara testifying, this time officially as our Secretary of Defense. And he said, to declare war in Vietnam 
would add a new psychological element to the international situation. Since in this century, declarations of war have come to imply dedication to the total destruction of the enemy. It would increase the danger of misunderstanding our true objectives. The August 2nd, 1961 issue of the Congressional Record contains a statement by Senator J.W. Fulbright, Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and, of course, a longtime exponent of the grand design. Here is what Fulbright said. In the long run, it is quite possible that the principal problem of leadership will be to restrain the desire of the people of America to hit the communists with everything we've got, particularly if there are more Cubas. Well, returning to the State Department, we find that by 1962, the man who was then running the Foreign Policy Planning Division was Walt Rostow, President Kennedy's Special Advisor on Foreign Affairs. In a report to the President entitled Basic National Security, Rostow stated, rising tensions or pleas of the American public must be ignored in any crisis with Russia. The temptation must be avoided to degrade or embarrass the Soviets in the eyes of the world. If you've been wondering why it is that we can't seem to win any wars against the communists, it's simply because it's our policy not even to embarrass them, much less to defeat them. In 1963, the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency financed a report by the Peace Research Institute published in April of that year. And here is what our tax dollars produced. Whether we admit it to ourselves or not, we benefit enormously from the capability of the Soviet police system to keep law and order over the 200 million Russians and the many additional millions in the satellite states. The breakup of the Russian communist empire today would doubtless be conducive to freedom, but would be a good deal more catastrophic for world order. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, according to the grand design, supposedly it's in our own self-interest for the Soviet police state to remain intact, to remain stable, and to maintain its death grip over the captive nations. Well, that kind of reasoning leads us next to the pages of one of the most influential newspapers in the world, the New York Times. On August 16, 1961, the Times ran this editorial. We must seek to discourage anti-communist revolts in order to avert bloodshed and war. We must, under our principles, live with evil, even if by so doing we help to stabilize tottering communist regimes and perhaps even expose citadels of freedom to slow death by strangulation. Is that shocking? Well, if you accept the premise of the grand design, it shouldn't be. It's then merely the cold and objective appraisal of our limited alternatives in this nuclear age. Well, let's bring this philosophy now to its ultimate conclusion and see what the world planners have to say about the future role of American sovereignty. Returning again to the words of Senator Fulbright, we find this most revealing book by him entitled old myths and new realities. And bear in mind that this was written by the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, one of the most influential legislative committees in Washington. Now on page 25, Senator Fulbright has this to say. The problem for American policy is not in defining what we would like. It is rather how to live with the best we can get. And then on page 87, he continues. The concept of national sovereignty has become in our time a principle of international anarchy. Our survival in this century may well turn out to depend upon whether we succeed in transferring at least some small part of our feelings of loyalty and responsibility from the sovereign nation to some larger political community. And then again, he repeats back here on page 108, just so that no one misunderstands what he's trying to say. The sovereign nation can no longer serve as the ultimate unit of personal 
loyalty, and responsibility. Well, I think it's pretty obvious that many of our leaders in Washington long ago have transferred substantial portions of their personal loyalty and responsibility from the sovereign nation of the United States to the larger political community called the United Nations. In their own minds, it's likely that they consider themselves to be citizens of the world first and citizens of the United States second. In any decision where the interests of America are in direct conflict with those of the larger political community, you can be sure that America will wind up on the short end. Our former Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, in a lecture at Ohio Wesleyan University entitled Toward World Unity, phrased it this way. What I initially propose involves an organization dedicated to the general welfare, the peace and order of mankind, and the assuming of an allegiance to this goal superior to that of any national allegiance. Well, returning again to the words of Walt Rostow, our former chief of the State Department Policy Planning Division, we find an unusually open and frank summary of the objectives of the grand design spelled out in his book, The United States in the World Arena, which incidentally was subsidized by the CIA. Way back here on page 549, Rostow says, it is a legitimate American national objective to see removed from all nations, including the United States, the right to use substantial military force to pursue their own interests. Since this residual right is the root of national sovereignty, it is therefore an American interest to see an end to nationhood as it has been historically defined. Well, Justice of the Supreme Court, William Douglas, wrote an essay entitled The Rule of Law in World Affairs, published in 1961 by the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions which in turn, of course, is financed by another of those tax-exempt foundations, the Fund for the Republic. On page 32, Douglas wrote, There is no reason for us to get tangled up in legalisms that march inexorably to the conclusion that total and complete sovereignty must be retained. For we now know that when that claim is pressed by all nations, everyone faces extinction in a nuclear holocaust. Well, that's a pretty precise summary of the grand design. In just two sentences, we're told that it's either world government or the bomb. Take your choice. By the way, the general theme and purpose of that pamphlet was to generate public support for increasing the power and prestige of the UN World Court, and also to lend support to a drive at that time for the repeal of the Connolly Amendment. Now, without getting too involved in this, I should explain that when the Senate ratified the UN statute of the International Court of Justice and agreed to commit the United States to accept the final decisions of the UN World Court, it was generally understood that the court would never meddle into our purely domestic affairs. But there were some who feared that in time, the world Supreme Court would begin to find legalistic ways to declare that what we think is strictly our own business and no one else's is, in a larger sense, also the concern of mankind. So, to prevent the world Supreme Court from extending its jurisdiction into our local affairs, the same way in which the federal Supreme Court has gradually assumed jurisdiction over what was once considered to be the local affairs of our own states, the Senate voted for an amendment to the statute proposed by Senator Tom Connolly. This amendment still stands and simply says that what is or is not a domestic affair of the United States will be determined by the United States, not by other nations or by the world court itself. And so it's understandable why the grand designers have felt the need to generate greater public support for the international world court and to repeal the Connolly Amendment. Now, on April 4th, 1960, Vice President Richard Nixon issued a statement under the official seal and letterhead of his office. And this statement read in part as follows. 
Many well-intentioned people have raised the basic question, why have an international court in the first place? The answer, putting it in its simplest and bluntest terms, is that even nations that are friends are bound to have disputes. If those disputes are not settled by negotiation, the only alternative left is to settle them either by force or by law. At a time when the use of force means unleashing nuclear weapons, which would destroy civilization, all sensible people agree that we must find some alternative to force for settling international disputes. Now that's really an incredible statement because in passing, we should keep in mind that law also is force. If the courts don't have the police and the armies to back up their decisions with force if necessary, then there's no law. Law is force, legalized. And so with this reality in mind, Mr. Nixon's statement continues. There are some today who believe that the prospect of the use of atomic weapons to settle international disputes is so terrible that we should set up a new all-powerful world organization which would have jurisdiction over disputes between nations. I disagree with this approach. I believe that rather than setting up a new international institution, we have to begin to use the one we already have. And then Vice President Nixon continues in his statement and concludes with strong assurances that we have nothing to fear and much to gain by repealing the Connolly Amendment. The international institution we already have, of course, is the United Nations. Most Americans good-heartedly accept the UN as a kind of farcical debating society. But I can assure you that the grand designers have other thoughts and plans. The May 1964 issue of the official UN Monthly Chronicle contains these glimpses into the future through the eyes of Secretary General Uthant. If we are to make the next step toward world authority and then onward to world government, it will be by the growth in authority and prestige of the United Nations and the International Court. Some form of regulatory international machinery of government in the true sense of the word is required. Such an authority cannot merely consist in a paper constitution and must be based in a certain degree of power. Well, a certain degree of power doesn't sound very menacing, but just how much power would it take to make the vision of a world government come true? Well, obviously it would take whatever amount is required to be superior to that of any political subdivision beneath it. It would have to be so powerful that no nation could be able to challenge it without risking nuclear annihilation at the hands of the UN Army. But of course, if that happened, no one could possibly object because it wouldn't be called an act of war. It would be a peacekeeping maneuver by a peacekeeping force and the mushroom cloud would rise from a peacekeeping bomb. Now, I know this must sound fantastic to some of you, so let's get back to the record. In 1961, the State Department published Document 7277, a booklet entitled Freedom From War, and the subtitle explains what it really is. The United States Program for General and Complete Disarmament in a Peaceful World. Now, this was our proposal submitted to the General Assembly of the United Nations for disarming and transferring to the UN complete control over our atomic weapons, our missiles, and our national army, navy, and air force as well. Everything except what we might need for a limited internal police function. Now after 18 pages of detailed proposals, we finally discover in plain language the ultimate goal of our disarmament program. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a direct quote. Disarmament would proceed to a point where no state would have the military power to challenge the progressively strengthened UN peace force. Well, of course, 1961 was a long time ago. And it's true that State Department Publication 7277 is no longer our official position on disarmament. It was replaced by this one, Arms Control and Disarmament Agency Publication 
uh, number four, General Series Three, and as you can see, it's entitled Blueprint for the Peace Race. On page 33, we find the new position. The parties to the treaty would progressively strengthen the United Nations Peace Force established in stage two until it had sufficient armed forces and armaments so that no state could challenge it. And so it has gone year after year, revision after revision. The basic objective of our disarmament proposals has been and is today the objective of the grand design, the creation of a true world government with sufficient military force to compel all nations, including our own, to obey. The January-February issue of Vista magazine, published by the United Nations Association, featured an exclusive interview with former President Eisenhower dealing with exactly this subject. The reporter, Mary Kersey Harvey, a senior editor of McCall's magazine, wanted to get the President's reaction to a proposal by Grenville Clark which would establish a permanent UN World Army. After outlining the Clark proposal for President Eisenhower, here is what Miss Harvey reported. The President studied the above plan quickly, and as I had expected, caught the ball and began to run with it. You'd have, he began to plan out loud, world marshals comparable to our US marshals backed by armed forces. Non-compliance with UN law, and you send in the UN forces. He orchestrated this point at some length. And too, he hammered away, the UN needs nuclear power. He bore down hard on the word nuclear. Take this example, he hurried on. You have two countries in a border argument. The UN orders the matter to be taken to the international court. One or both of the disputants refuses to submit to compulsory arbitration. The UN, which by now has in its possession a fleet of submarines armed with nuclear warheads deployed around the world, orders one of the submarines to proceed to the area. The world is then told that if firing breaks out for any reason whatsoever, a tactical nuclear weapon will be delivered onto the disputed territory. If this threat fails to prevent armed conflict, you back it up with action. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the grand design for preventing nuclear war. Well, that's all the quotations and exhibits that time permits, which is in a way unfortunate because the examples I've used so far have been slightly top-heavy with Republicans. If I had more time, I could balance it out and then get everybody mad at me. But seriously, ladies and gentlemen, it's just as easy to find the sentiments expressed here within the top ranks of one major party as it is the other. The grand design has absolutely nothing to do with partisan politics. These men aren't nearly as much Republicans or Democrats as they are world politicians. They've got bigger things to occupy their minds than mere party labels. To them, Partisan politics is only a game to amuse the masses who crave the showmanship of big national conventions, the excitement of partisan campaigns, and the satisfaction of casting a vote in the illusion that somehow they're really helping to decide the important issues of the day. But with precious few exceptions. For the past two decades, the American voter has had to make his choice between Grand Designer A and Grand Designer B. It's always a source of amazement to me when I hear someone criticize our leaders for being confused in the area of foreign policy, of reversing their position, of bungling the job and not having any long-range goals. These men are not bungling the job. They're acting in accordance with a definite, well-thought-out plan. And they've been executing that plan with brilliant precision. We may or may not like the plan, but let's not kid ourselves into thinking that there isn't any. Now, I, for one, don't like the plan. And you may wonder why not. As you recall, earlier I said that when I was first exposed to the grand design, it seemed like a compelling argument. After all, each of these steps do seem to progress logically one to the other. So, having taken this much time merely to expound and explain a point of view which I no longer accept, 
I think the least I can do now is to offer the reasons for having changed my mind and to expose what I consider to be the fatal flaws of the grand design. Ladies and gentlemen, there are at least two major fallacies that need to be understood if we're to overcome the arguments of containment, coexistence, accommodation, and ultimate merger with world communism. First of all, the premise behind these arguments is wrong. And you know you can't do much with a piece of logic if you start out with a faulty premise. The premise underlying the grand design is this. If all-out war should develop between major powers today, well, stop right there, because we've already passed it. Back up all the way to the very first word, if. If. Ladies and gentlemen, when are we going to get it through our heads that all-out war is being waged against us right now and has been for a long time? And by all-out war, I mean total war, not just military war. We're so used to thinking in terms of the old-fashioned concepts of warfare in which the primary weapons were guns and bombs we fail to realize that for the first time in history, we're facing an enemy that has mastered the concept of total warfare. World War III that rages around us right now is a political war, an economic war, a psychological war, a spiritual war, and a military war. But the military aspect is the least important of all. The only way that military strategy plays a role in the communist blueprint is in the form of guerrilla tactics, aimed at creating internal chaos and anarchy, to create the kind of conditions conducive for the quick seizure of power centers by a small group of organized and well-trained revolutionaries. That's the only kind of military strategy you'll find in the communist manuals, whether written by Lenin, Mao Zedong, or Che Guevara. And even this kind of limited military activity could never succeed without the simultaneous waging of non-military war. The communist guerrilla bands wouldn't stand a chance of succeeding in most countries without other communists operating secretly among the people to create the appearance of popular support, operating within the communications media to generate propaganda, and operating inside the government itself to create the necessary corruption, bickering, and apparent inefficiency to prevent that government from moving strongly against the guerrilla groups. In Cuba, for instance, Almost everyone remembers that when Batista fled the country, an army of over 45,000 soldiers surrendered without a fight to only about 1,800 revolutionaries under Castro. But very few people were aware that the general who surrendered these forces was himself a member of the Communist Party in Cuba, a perfect example of the non-military strategy of infiltration and treason producing an apparent military victory. The favorite weapons of communist conquest are not engines of mass destruction in the hands of soldiers wearing a recognizable uniform. They are instead propaganda, the slanted view of history, the preaching of hatred to incite civil disorder, the tactics of internal subversion, treason, blackmail, the smear, political assassination, all committed by soldiers who wear no uniform and who claim to be loyal citizens of the target country marked for conquest from within. This is how communism has spread across the globe, not with invading armies or bombs, and it's extremely unlikely that they'd abandon this non-military strategy, which has been so effective for them, right at the zenith of their success. Now, without a doubt, the bomb is the most powerful weapon in the communist arsenal, but it's as a psychological weapon, not as a military one. The Soviets have gained more by using the bomb as a psychological weapon than they ever could have using it as a military weapon. Under the constant threat of nuclear annihilation, we've accepted concessions, compromises, and defeats one after another, which would have been unthinkable without that specter of a giant mushroom cloud fixed deep in our subconscious. As a matter of fact, the bomb, as a psychological weapon, is being dropped on the American people every single day. Movies such as On the Beach, Seven Days in May, Dr. Strangelove, Failsafe, Planet of the Apes. These well-produced and entertaining movies have done really a professional job of strengthening, subconsciously at least, 
the premise of the grand design. Motion pictures, of course, aren't the only source of this conditioning of the public mind. Radio, TV, books, magazines, and newspapers have all played more than their part. The message that has more or less been drummed into our heads follows the pattern pretty well presented in this illustrated brochure entitled, Let There Be a World, written by Felix Green. Green is well known in ultra leftist circles as an importer of propaganda film from Red China and for his lectures and motion pictures extolling the virtues of life under communism in Asia. And by the way, I picked this up not too long ago at the communist bookstore in Los Angeles, the progressive bookshop it's called. Every once in a while I browse around in there just to find out what the progressives and the intellectuals are reading nowadays. And this is a classic example. Page after page of beautifully reproduced photographs, all depicting in minute detail the horrors of nuclear war and the beauties of disarmament and peace. Just take a look at a few of these. And naturally, just for openers, we see here in the beginning the fireball and the mushroom cloud. And then the charred bodies at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Grim reminders of the, the pain and the suffering of any war, but particularly of nuclear war. And then for those of us with weak imaginations, we're shown what could happen to our cities. According to this map, if one of the super bombs were dropped on Manhattan Island, we could cross off everything clear out to Bridgeport, Connecticut and fallout would take care of the rest, probably clear to California. And speaking of fallout, they have a special section here just for the ladies. Preserved in jars of formaldehyde, these are the grotesque remains after autopsy of tiny infants stillborn and deformed, supposedly as a result of radioactive fallout. Now, what woman can look at these, or what man for that matter, without some kind of a lasting emotional reaction against even the mere thought of risking nuclear war. Well, here, rather graphically presented, is what at least is supposedly the only way that we can prevent this from happening to us. Disarmament, of course. And finally, back here at the very end, the appeal to the heartstrings. Let there be a world. It's really quite well done, I think. You have to give these people credit for knowing how to merchandise an idea. By the way, these are generally the same people who like to label anti-communists as being fright peddlers. Well, with regard to this particular book, I'm not saying that these pictures are phony or that the devastating effects of nuclear war have been exaggerated to the public for propaganda purposes although there's now a great deal of evidence to support both of these contentions, but that's not the point. The point is that the motion picture producers, the TV commentators and the publishers who are so creative in their ability to convey to us all the horrors of death under a nuclear bomb, for some reason, never get around to portraying the fact that there are other horrible ways to die. We're shown the mushroom cloud but not the mask graves or the torture devices that exist behind the iron and bamboo curtains. We're shown the charred bodies at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but not the emaciated bodies of the living dead in Soviet concentration camps, or the mutilated corpses of innocent civilians hacked to pieces by communist terrorists in one country after another. It's not that there aren't pictures like this, it's just that we're seldom allowed to see them or be reminded of them through the accepted channels of mass communication. Now here are just two examples out of many that could be offered. Two documents that have been readily available for a long time. They contain material which almost has been totally denied to the American people. The first is a government pamphlet entitled, Lest We Forget, a pictorial summary of communism in action. It consists primarily of photographs smuggled out of Eastern Europe, providing documentary proof of communist atrocities committed in those lands in order to liquidate anti-communist opposition 
and to terrorize the people into submission. Now there's no professional touch here, but the pictures still tell the story. We have the mass graves, the soundproof torture chambers, and the, well, I guess you'd say they would be the pitiful victims of a deliberate program of mass starvation. You know, it's actually hard to believe that these children, even down to age two, were starved in this fashion in communist forced labor camps. Well, now the other example is this pamphlet entitled on the morning of March 15th. And it consists of photographs and factual descriptions of the results of a communist terrorist raid in northern Angola on the morning of March 15, 1961. Over 200 Europeans and 300 Africans were murdered on that one day alone. Over 50 widely separated places along a 400 mile front were attacked almost simultaneously. In most places, every man, woman, child and infant Every living creature, even the cats and the dogs, were killed in the most brutal and sadistic manner imaginable. Now here are some of the less nauseating photographs, which hardly need description. You know, seeing that picture of the infant in the bassinet reminds me of one account which, forgive me ladies, I must read, even though it sickens me to do so. A group of some 400 terrorists attacked the experimental farm at the bridge. One of the few survivors of this attack, Manuel Lorenco Alves, relates what happened. The assault began at six in the morning, and all the houses on the farm, whether they belonged to Europeans, Africans, or mulattoes, were attacked simultaneously. The women were dragged out of their houses together with their children. In front of the mothers, the terrorists then proceeded to cut off the legs and arms of the children, and then started to play a grotesque game of football with the twitching bodies. The women and girls were then led away, stripped, raped, and cut up. Ladies and gentlemen, I've discussed these scenes and shown these pictures, not because of any desire to be sensational, believe me, but merely to help balance the scales of our judgment, to emphasize the almost forgotten fact nowadays that there are other horrible ways to die. Ways, as a matter of fact, that make the instant flash of a nuclear bomb seem merciful by comparison. And keep in mind that these other horrible ways to die are not the result of an event that happened almost a quarter of a century ago. We're talking about events that are happening right now to thousands of helpless human beings somewhere every day, millions every year. And we're not examining the unfortunate byproduct of an effort to bring an end to a long and bloody war. These incredible acts of brutality are the deliberate, premeditated works of men whose sole purpose is the destruction of human life and human values. That we're so saturated with peace propaganda and the specter of the mushroom cloud that we seldom have occasion to ponder these facts. And because of this one-sided exposure, Millions of Americans have been conditioned without their even knowing it to fear the horror of nuclear war far more than they fear the terror of a communist peace. The communists have been winning this war because they've mastered the art of total warfare, while we've been conditioned to cower in fearful expectation 
of a war limited only to weapons of mass destruction. And so the premise of the grand design starts right off with a faulty assumption. Instead of wondering what might happen if all-out war should develop, we must wake up to the fact that we are in an all-out war right now for our very survival. And instead of allowing ourselves to become afflicted with a nuclear war fixation, we must recognize that because communist strategy is what it is, the chances of this war ever involving an exchange of nuclear warheads is so remote as to be almost incalculable in the overall equation. But that isn't all that's wrong with the grand design. Another fallacy that needs to be exposed once and for all is the absurd conclusion that victory is impossible. Ladies and gentlemen, victory not only is possible, it's inevitable. Let me repeat that because it's so important. If you remember nothing else I've said, remember this. Victory not only is possible, it is inevitable. The only question is, for which side? It's inconceivable that the forces of freedom and the forces of slavery can coexist side by side indefinitely. One or the other is going to triumph in our lifetime. And if you want to satisfy your curiosity as to which side it's going to be, all you have to do is take a piece of paper and a pencil and a graph paper and mark off one side with the year starting 1945. On the other side, using whatever measure you wish, Mark the relative level of prestige, power, and influence of the United States and of world communism. Chart the progress through the years right up to the present. And I think you'll find the resulting bar graph to be highly instructive. With hardly any deviation in the line, the power of world communism has been moving steadily upward, while that of the United States has been moving and sinking from one new depth to another. Take a ruler, then and project both of these lines into the future. And you can see in very graphic form that unless there are some drastic changes in US foreign policy, a policy that's been followed consistently by all administrations and both political parties since 1945, we are going to lose. It's as simple as that. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not a prophet of doom. I'm not saying that we're going to lose. I'm saying only that in order for us to have any chance to win, we must first wake up to the reality of that grand design that is U.S. foreign policy, and then we must set about to change it. And that, of course, leads us to the third and final question. Change it to what? Now, ladies and gentlemen, you'd better hang on tight for this next part, because I know from experience that the ground ahead gets pretty rough in places. Some of you are going to be shocked, and the rest probably scared right out of your wits. Because I'm going to propose my own grand design. I call it the grand design for victory. And it's not for the faint-hearted. Step one in my grand design for victory is the premise that we must be captains of our own ship. We must restore our military, economic, and political independence from the strangling entanglements of that budding world government called the United Nations. Instead of phasing out our best weapons, we should phase out all disarmament programs and those who propose them. As we should have learned at Pearl Harbor, disarmed and militarily unprepared nations are far more apt to become involved in war than those fully prepared to strike back. The best way to preserve the peace is to be prepared for war. And the best way to end the arms race is to move so far out in front that it ceases even to be a race. Now, instead of seeking ways to water down our principles and our traditions to the point where they can be accepted and merged with those of the majority of the world, we should be striving actually to improve and upgrade our American way of life even beyond present standards. And then let the rest of the world follow our example if they so wish. With regard to world communism, we must face up to the reality that whether we admit it or not, and whether we like it or not, we are now engaged in World War III, a total war in which the stakes are nothing less than our lives and our freedoms. 
And in this war, our goal must not be containment of or coexistence with communism. It must be victory over communism in order for us even to survive. It's not that we want it that way. It's just that we have no other choice. Now, before you nod in agreement with this goal of victory over communism, let me clarify just what that means. I'm not thinking in terms of those empty phrases and platitudes that so often fall from the lips of politicians. When I say victory over communism, I mean exactly that. Wherever the communists choose to advance by overt military force, whether that force manifests itself in the form of a Berlin blockade or a Vietnam guerrilla war of so-called national liberation, no matter what form it takes, it must be destroyed immediately by superior military force. And notice I didn't say checkmated, I said destroyed. International crime not only must be stopped, it must be punished. Now, of course, the question that rushes to mind at this point is, what about the danger of escalation? Ladies and gentlemen, the total objective of military warfare, once it breaks out, is to escalate it as rapidly as possible to beyond the endurance of the enemy so he'll quit fighting. Without escalation, the slaughter continues on and on with no end in sight, and in fact, no goal worthy of the sacrifice. Come to the table, we say to the communist thugs. We mean you no harm. All we ask is that you stop killing people for a while, long enough for us to hold a conference to see if we can't negotiate something to you that you want. I wonder how many of you would be willing to give your lives for that. And yet, that is the goal for which we've asked over a million Americans in uniform to be willing to die if necessary. And I don't think it's worth a single drop of American blood. When you put a young man in uniform and ask him to face an enemy in mortal combat, You'd better give that boy every chance in the world to win so he can come home. And that, ladies and gentlemen, means escalation. In Southeast Asia, instead of fighting the communist forces on the ground in an exchange of manpower, we should have followed General MacArthur's proposal to take the war directly to the nerve centers of the enemy's home base using our superior air power. Fighting on the ground, man for man, against the limitless population reserves of communist Asia is just about the only way the United States possibly could lose a war. Destroy from the air the sources of supplies and leadership. Then the guerrilla fighting on the ground would soon wither to no more than a local police problem. When the enemy suddenly realizes that the cards are no longer stacked in his favor, that he no longer has privileged sanctuaries, and that he might even stand to lose something for starting a war, he'll come to that peace table so fast it'll make your head swim. And when he gets there, there's only one thing we discuss with him, his surrender terms, nothing else. Now, any serious plan for victory over communism must recognize the need to accept the help of all willing and trustworthy allies. Yet in Korea, and again in Vietnam, the nationalist Chinese have begged us to accept over a half a million of their well-trained, fully equipped, strongly motivated troops, either to fight alongside our boys or to replace them altogether. And we decline to accept. Why? Well, of course, it's not really so hard to understand when you recall the grand design. If the nationalist Chinese were ever allowed to get into what is basically their own battle against Red China, they just might get an uncontrollable urge to go home to the mainland. They might not stop when they got to the Yalu or the DMZ. In fact, they might even try to win, and that would ruin everything. <laughs> but that is precisely my point. Instead of cowering and trembling in fear at the dreaded possibility of Red China coming into a war, we should hope and pray that the anti-communist Chinese and Koreans and Vietnamese would drag Red China into a war, screaming and kicking, and then by triggering internal revolts, liberate her people from the yoke of communist slavery once and for all. And we mustn't back away from this one bit if we're really serious about victory. For our goal must not be merely to keep the communists out of South Korea or South Vietnam. That isn't victory. 
That's containment. It must include removing the communists from North Korea, North Vietnam, Red China, Cuba, Eastern Europe, and from the very first captive nation, Russia itself. Just as we could not rest in World War II until every last vestige of Nazism was stamped out everywhere, for ten times that reason, we can never hope today to have peace or security until every last communist regime is removed from the face of the earth. It's not that we want it that way. It's just that we have no other choice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if this sounds risky, it's because it is. Let's not kid ourselves. The proposal I have just outlined is very risky business. The only thing more risky is the grand design we are now following. For if we continue on that course, we have no odds at all for our survival. Now this doesn't mean that we have to invade all these countries with soldiers. And it certainly doesn't mean that we should go around dropping the bomb on everybody. And if you're thinking that this is what my proposal implies, then that's a pretty good indication that you're still thinking in terms of old-fashioned warfare. Now, it's true that occasionally, whenever the conditions seem ripe, the communists do resort to brute force and semi-military tactics to advance their cause. When this happens, then the contest clearly must be won with military means. But because of the very nature of communist strategy, these hot spots never have and never will be more than diversionary tactics to implement the larger strategy in the total war, which is predominantly non-military. Just as we are losing this war through non-military means, if we ever hope to win it, we'll have to do so through exactly those same non-military means. Let me give you a few quick examples of how this can be achieved. First of all, and the most obvious of all, we must stop all trade and aid to communist regimes. Let these so-called socialist paradises try to exist on their own unproductive and bureaucracy-bound systems for a change without being able to run to Uncle Sugar every time they're in trouble and see how long they'd last. I don't think that they'd last two years. Now, secondly, I propose that we recognize all communist regimes. Recognize them, that is, for what they are our mortal enemies. And if we do that, then we withdraw diplomatic recognition from them, no longer invite their leaders to dine in the White House, and we send their espionage agents posing as diplomats packing from our shores. Now, our non-military strategy for victory over world communism must take into account that our strongest allies and our greatest army already is within the enemy camp. But these captive peoples behind the iron and bamboo curtains have learned the hard way that although American leaders talk a good line about world freedom, when the chips are down, they don't deliver the goods. Do you want to meet some bitter people? Talk to a few Hungarian refugees or some Cubans whose loved ones were abandoned at the Bay of Pigs. I'll never forget one conversation with a young Hungarian freedom fighter he described how for months prior to the revolt, American radio transmitters in Europe had been beaming broadcasts into Hungary, encouraging the people to revolt and promising full support. Now, to men and women who are fighting for their lives, full support does not mean moral support and good wishes. It means guns and ammunition. And so when the revolt finally broke out, this young man told how sure he and his friends were that America would come to their help. After all, we promised. Each day, they'd radio a desperate plea to the free world for military supplies, particularly bazookas and hand grenades, something that would be effective against Soviet tanks that were then forming an iron ring around Budapest. And then they'd go to the airport and wait. Finally, on about the fourth day, an American transport plane circled the field for landing. And when they looked up and saw that big, beautiful American star on the side of the plane, he said they began to cry like babies because at last the Americans had come through. 
When the plane landed, they were so anxious to find out what kind of weapons had been sent, they scrambled aboard and began to pry open the wooden crates with their bare hands. And do you know what they found? Powdered milk. They were stunned. They couldn't believe it. And then one of them got the idea that maybe the Americans had been clever enough to camouflage their shipment by hiding hand grenades or at least bullets inside the cans. And so they got a can opener and began desperately to open one can after another. But each was the same, powdered milk. Well, actually, it was disclosed later that at the same time we were declining to offer any real help to the Hungarian freedom fighters, our State Department sent a communique to communist Yugoslavia and thus indirectly to the whole communist world that made it clear we would not take any action to prevent the Soviets from putting down this revolt in Hungary. The message read as follows. The United States looks with disfavor upon governments unfriendly to the Soviet Union on the borders of the Soviet Union. And since Hungary lies on the border of the Soviet Union, with that assurance of non-intervention from the United States, the fate of the freedom fighters of Hungary was sealed. But returning to the young refugee telling the story, after describing the scene at the airport, he looked at me and he said, when we needed your help, you chose instead to be friends with the Soviets. My people will never trust the United States again, or at least as long as the American flag flies over your embassy in Budapest as a reminder to us that your ambassador of goodwill continues to exchange cordial greetings with our hated masters. On the day that you lower your flag, and call home your ambassador. On that day, my people will fight again. And these are just about his exact words. I've had reason to reflect on that statement many times since. And I've come to the conclusion that if the captive peoples behind the iron and bamboo curtains were ever given any reason to believe that we were really on their side, instead of seeking an accommodation with their masters, it's my conviction that they would take courage, rise up as one, and topple their communist regimes the same way they were imposed in the first place from the inside, and we wouldn't have to fire a shot. But we do have to stop helping the communists. We do have to stop dignifying their leaders as legitimate representatives of the people. And we do have to stand firm for a change and declare openly in word and deed our uncompromising dedication to victory over communism everywhere in the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that probably would be an easy place for me to end. Three cheers for victory. But it's not quite that simple. I'd be less than honest with you if I closed it at this point, because we still are missing one final but very important consideration. Even though it's true that the bomb is primarily a psychological weapon today, and even though the chances are microscopically small that the bomb would be used in either our victory or our defeat, nevertheless, we can't entirely rule out the possibility. No matter how remote, it still exists. So now what is our position? Do we give up the whole idea and return blindly to the hope that somehow we can coexist at least for a little while longer so we can enjoy life to the fullest in the time we have left? I think not. I have too much faith in the American people once they fully understand what the choice is. Putting it very bluntly, ladies and gentlemen, if we are not willing to risk our lives, our beautiful cities, and all the material things which we value for those principles in which we believe, then how can we have the audacity to send our sons into a foreign battlefield and ask them to give their lives for those principles. Are their lives any less precious than ours? As far as I'm concerned, when we send that first American soldier into battle, when we first ask him to be willing to lay down his life for us, we put the whole nation right on the line behind him. And if we are not willing to do this, then this is no longer the home of the brave nor much longer the land of the free. 
Well, these are the heavy thoughts I leave with you. And I don't know quite how to close this presentation without running the risk of sounding corny, because the sentiment I want to express here has often been ridiculed as being corny. But to me, it's far from that. It's an article of faith that needs to be reaffirmed in the public mind openly, without shame or embarrassment. And it's simply this. As Americans today, we are truly a privileged people in a privileged land. But with our blessings come responsibilities, and with responsibilities come risks. The challenge of our time is that we must accept both the responsibilities of our blessings and the risks involved in defending them for ourselves and for future generations. And we must do this without hesitation if we are to be worthy benefactors of that precious heritage of freedom passed on to us through the epic sacrifices of those who have gone before. Now that is not flag waving and it is not cliched patriotism. That's a simple statement of the obligations of citizenship in this glorious land, our land, which with God's help we shall preserve.